before I hand it over to the speakers, um, my name is Macy and I am the Education Officer at Drug Science, their Student Society Network. And I partnered up with Rowan, who is part of the Medical Cannabis Clinician Society, to help set up this webinar. So yeah, this is a collaboration between Drug Science and the Medical Cannabis Clinician Society. So before I hand it over to speakers, I just wanted to do a brief introduction of everyone that's going to be talking this evening. So firstly, we'll hear from Dr. Leon Barron, who is a GP based in London and has specific interests in mental health, as well as being a committee member of the Medical Cannabis Clinician Society. So Dr. Barron will be taking us through the history of cannabis, as well as then running us through the laws, the current laws and legislations in the UK surrounding medical cannabis. Following this, we'll have Alkioni Afen Asiyu Frakuli, who is, I hope I pronounced that right, Alkioni, <laughs> who is a medical cannabis and psychedelic researcher at Drug Science and currently manages T21, which is the UK's largest medical cannabis research. Alkioni will be enlightening us to the current findings um, that have been found within T21, as well as then providing some insights into what these findings can provide for the future of medical cannabis within the UK. And then last but definitely not least is Rosie Vaz, who is a current T21 medical cannabis patient for ADHD and fibromyalgia. She has been kind enough to, to, be, to be open with us this evening about her experience on T21 and as a medical cannabis patient. So again, before I hand it over to the speakers, I just wanted to see if everyone at home, viewing this from home would be comfortable in, in the comments section, leaving some thoughts about a few questions I have for them. So I just wanted to ask you all what you think medical cannabis is and what you think the current UK legislations are surrounding medical cannabis. So yeah, leave, leave your thoughts in the comments if you feel comfortable to do that, or if not, grab a pen and paper at home and then yeah have a little thought through what you think medical cannabis is and what you think the current UK legislations are surrounding medical cannabis. Restrictive. <laughs> yes Jill. <laughs> Fairly restrictive. Cannabis healing of the nation of Mali. <laughs> Difficult to access under current legislations. Prescribed only by private doctors. Human rights being ignored. It's better than it is used since legislation for medical cannabis used in 2018. Any cannabis based product. It's a life saving medicine for me. It needs to be available on NHS for chronic pain and mental health. Oh gosh. Suspended from five works now. Stigma from health professionals prescribed by private doctors. Very limited. Yes. So, yeah, thank you all so much for sharing your thoughts here. Obviously, keep discussions going in the chat between yourselves as well if that's what you feel comfortable with and like to engage with and if you guys have any questions for the speakers throughout please just drop it in the q a um chat box and then we will get to those once all the speakers have had their time to get their inputs and thoughts um so yeah now i would like to hand it over to leon so take it away please That's better, isn't it? You can hear me now. Thank you, Macy. Hi to everyone who's joined online. Uh, it's lovely to see so many of you, actually. That's a good number for a webinar. So, uh, yeah, that's fantastic. So just to give a little bit of an introduction, um, as Macy said, I'm a GP by training. Uh, most of my day-to-day -day work is very much clinical work, patient-facing. I do some teaching as well at the university at the at UCL Medical School in London. So uh, I'm involved with some teaching for undergraduate medicine. And I've been involved in this space for about five years now. Uh, it was rather uh, really kind of through serendipity I met 
uh, I, I met Mike Barnes actually in Hannah Deacon just before law change. Um, someone I knew had met them. Can't remember even how it came about, but I was invited to a talk in 2018 by uh, by Mike. And uh, some of you might might know Mike Barnes. He's very well known in medical cannabis space. And it was a talk about the the medical properties and the science um, around the plant and uh, and around its medical use. And there were some um, visiting lecturers and um, and I went along to it. And it was for me, it was just fascinating. And it kind of correlated with patients that I treated over the years who who I knew were using cannabis for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and it kind of just made me think about it more and learn, try and learn more about it. And I was also at a point in my career where I found a lot of patients and people that I was treating were also not perhaps responding to more conventional licensed medicines. So it came along at an interesting time for me. And the more I started reading about it and uh, and learning about it and also reaching out beyond the UK as well, realizing that this was kind of a global thing. And there were loads of academic, there were lots of academics and um, uh, they, basically data and trials being run globally that were really useful and interesting. So, um, so yeah, that was kind of a, my, my, my path into it. And, um, and I've remained pretty active in the space. I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. So I've got a few slides to present, but I don't want to uh, drown you all in PowerPoint slides. Um, but since uh, since this is this was my brief, I've tried to to stick to it, and we're going to talk a little bit about. Uh, I'm going to try and give you a bit of background and a general overview of, of cannabis and medical cannabis to hopefully um, make you feel a little bit more informed about what's going on uh, and put things in context uh, somewhat uh, with regards to the UK and access. So I'll try and keep it within about 15 to 20 minutes. If there's any questions along the way, just, just raise your hands. So this is me. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I do quite a range of work. Uh, I'm within the medical cannabis space now. Um, I'm currently the chair of the Medical Cannabis Clinician Society. I do some work for Drug Science Medical Cannabis Group. We also run the APPG, uh, which is an all-party parliamentary group on medical cannabis. So we regularly engage with policymakers, and that's cross-party. And then more recently, I'm doing some work for um, Grow Lab Organics, who are a company based on, on the Isle of Man as a sort of advisor to those, those guys. So I'm going to talk a, a bit about the history of cannabis. This in itself, in all honesty, is, a, is its own lecture because it's such an interesting uh, subject in its own right. And there's lots of um, interesting information. So if, if it takes your interest, then by all means, go online and have a read up on this because it, it is fascinating. Anyway, the first thing to say is, of course, cannabis is not a new medicine. It feels quite new to doctors here in the UK, but it certainly isn't a new medicine. It's probably the oldest medicine known, known to, uh, to man and civilization. And its use dates back to ancient China around 10,000 years BCE. Um, so it was utilized for its medical properties. But hemp, of course, was also a very important um, product. And hemp, as some of you may know, is a, is a is a basically just a variety of cannabis. It's bred for industrial use. It has uh, tough, long uh, stalks and stems, and it can be used for industrial purposes. So, so hemp kind of also uh, is part of this story. But I guarantee you go through almost every civilization throughout history, and you will find the documented use of cannabis for for medical purposes. And it was utilized for all kinds of um, ailments. Um, and these, these are documented yet, um, in, in ancient artifacts and manuscripts. So there's lots uh, of references in ancient China. Uh, it was used for things like gout, rheumatism, malaria. Uh, this, uh, the Abus papyrus, which is the oldest fully intact medical text in the world. And it talks about using cannabis to treat inflammation. It uses uh, references it as a suppository uh, for pelvic period pains, etc. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's there's lots in the um, in the literature searches, and um, I guess it wasn't until the 20th century that cannabis began to appear in, more in Western um, Western society, Western medicine, and there are a couple of key names um, in the history books. One is an Irish physician, William. Brooke O'Shaughnessy, who had been 
uh, based in um, in India, and he brought cannabis back to him back to Britain in 1842. Um, between 1850 to 1937, it was used as a prime medicine for more than 100 separate illnesses or diseases. And William Osler, uh, who you see there on the bottom right, was uh, one of the um, early kind of founding fathers of modern medicine, and he wrote comprehensive textbooks and and routinely reference cannabis. Uh, Queen Victoria famously used uh, medical cannabis as well. So it's very old medicine. It was very widely used. And um, it's not until you get to the 20th century um, that you, uh, sorry, the 21st century that you begin to see its, its decline in use. Um, why was that? Well, in, in simple, simple terms, um, it was, it was, it was hijacked predominantly for political reasons. So um, the chap there on the right is a, is a chap called Harry Anslinger. Um, and he was the first commissioner of the US Treasury Department Federal Bureau, Bureau of Narcotics. And he was involved with um, uh, drug uh, prohibition. So after alcohol, after um, alcohol was allowed uh, so after prohibition, essentially the government at that time were looking at ways of um, kind of tightening down on other other drugs, and they uh, they latched onto cannabis. And um, if you look through the timeline, you'll see that it slowly becomes harder to to prescribe and to access and, and to study. So there was a tax a marijuana tax act, which basically meant that um, doctors who prescribed it were taxed. And what they did, they did a very good job of linking cannabis with immigration and other policies of the time. So essentially, it was hijacked for political purposes. What that meant, unfortunately, is we probably lost the best part of 60, 70 years of, of research. Um, and it's still there are still restrictions on the sort of uh, federal law in the US that date back to this time. Interestingly, in the UK, it was actually it could still be prescribed until the early 1970s. Uh, but then uh, things change after that. If we go forwards to 2018, I'll come on to this a little bit more later, but it was rescheduled. Uh, and that was after policymakers recognised its therapeutic value and sort of revisited the, uh, the data and the, um, <clears throat> the, the evidence base. Okay, so I put a few reasons why it was, uh, why it was uh, in decline in the, early, uh, in the early 20th century. Now, don't forget also this coincides with um, the introduction of synthetic um, pharmaceutical medicines, which were easier to dose, easier to uh, inject, if you like, and uh, um, and and uh, often had kind of more uh, accurate delivery mechanisms. So, um, so yeah, compared to cannabis, uh, cannabis compared to opioids, for example, couldn't be injected as easily. And then I've talked about some of these key uh dates that kind of restricted its access and and its um, ability to be researched however as i said in the last few decades we've seen a massive resurgence um, in its uh, in its use cannabis of course is not unique um in that it's a plant-based medicine and there's lots of medicines that we're uh that we're prescribed or we, we we take either as patients or we prescribe as doctors opioids of course are the, probably the most common but there's others that i've listed here uh so it's kind of strange in a way that kind of we have this deep rooted stigma around the cannabis plant when uh we don't have this uh approach to other plant-based medicines so as I said earlier, the uh, the UK I'm going to focus on now. Of course, across the world, um, every country kind of has its own uh, history and kind of unique path into this. But in the UK, the the change in law in 2018 was largely driven by a political campaign that was focused on children with epilepsy. So uh, there were a handful of quite famous high profile cases at that time where. Um, parents of children with uh, with treatment resistant epilepsy had really exhausted all options and out of desperation some of them were um, traveling abroad to access whole plant cannabis products uh, so sublingual oils and uh, and found that these were often incredibly effective so we found ourselves as a nation uh, faced with the fact that there were families of young children who were 
how many go overseas and they weren't allowed to bring these medications back. So there's a, a, there was a, a, a big campaign, high profile media campaign, and the law has changed in 2018. You could argue somewhat that this was a reactive law change uh, to help uh, this particular situation. And I think the reason I say that is I question how well uh, how well thought through it was at the time. I think it was quite reactive to basically solving this problem with epilepsy. Uh, although we'll come to find out it hasn't fully solved that problem. And it's also led to other issues around access as well. So this was the uh, paper that was put out at the time. And the chief medical officer, Professor Dame Sally Davis, was given the task of basically reviewing all the available evidence at the time to decide whether or not this um, was something that had therapeutic value. That's essentially what she was asked to do. Is it a drug of, um, of, of harm and has no therapeutic value or is there some form of therapeutic value? And that really is the difference between a schedule one and a schedule two um, drug. So what she said was, was um, I'm not gonna read it out fully, but essentially there was enough evidence to say that there is a therapeutic benefit and that we should move um, not the whole of cannabis, but specifically cannabis-based products for medical use that fit certain criteria into a Schedule II category, uh, which allowed, of course, the prescribing of, of cannabis by, by specialists. Who can prescribe? The Home Office law that was subsequently put through um, made the point that only a GMC uh, only a doctor on the GMC specialist register can initiate a script. What that means in practice is a, is a, is a consultant, not a GP, a, a hospital consultant or someone that is on the specialist register. The most um, common prescribing at the moment is generally from pain consultants or psychiatrists. Um, there is the possibility for shared care. It's quite difficult to arrange in, in practice. And there's lots of reasons for that. But um, interestingly, there are no restrictions on the conditions that can be prescribed, which differs elsewhere. There are many countries around the world that are very specific about what can and can't be prescribed. Um, but the UK law does stipulate that it has to be initiated by a specialist. This is the actual wording. Again, I'm, I think it's too kind of uh, technical to, to read through now, but if any of you are interested, this is the actual definition of a cannabis-based product for medical use in humans. It has to be produced in an EU GMP facility so basically the MHRA, who are our regulator of medicines, have to be happy that it fits criteria, and then they'll permit the import um, of, of that particular medicine. They look for certain things in the, in the product. So uh, you have to, as a producer, you have to provide details of the amount of THC and CBD in a product and provide a certificate of analysis. Um, and uh, of course, also give kind of the various they have to, uh, the producers of the product have to meet certain criteria of the uh, certificates. There's also uh, has to be a, a need, um, a clinical need letter that has to be provided by the specialist. And these medicines are provided on a named patient basis. So they're Schedule II drugs, they're also controlled drugs, and they're unlicensed medicines, and they're special medicines. The reason I make all those points is every step, everything that you add in, every layer you add in on these makes them uh, more difficult to um, prescribe and to kind of uh, process and manage um, because there are restrictions around all of these types of medicines. And they, they differ, of course, to licensed medicines. So um, there are three licensed medicines in the UK. And when I say licensed medicine, what I mean by that is this, these medicines have gone through clinical trials and they've been granted a license by the MHRA who regulate medicines in the UK for specific conditions. Uh, Sativex is licensed for spasticity in MS and it's a schedule four drug. Uh, Nabilone is quite a rare medicine, but it, it's used for uh, chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. And Epidiolex is a schedule five drug that is used for intractable epilepsy and for two particular subtypes. Epidiolex, um, by the way, is, is largely just purified CBD, um, but it's very expensive actually for um, to be prescribed. The unlicensed cannabis-based medicines are what I touched upon earlier. Those are those um, Schedule II drugs that haven't been through clinical trials. And the, when we talk about medical cannabis on prescription, largely we're talking about unlicensed 
cannabis-based medicines that are these in this category here. Um, and of course, there are now lots of these products in the market. They're usually prescribed as a, well, they're prescribed either as a sublingual oil. And actually in the UK, there's a lot of flour as well that's being prescribed. Just a brief note on CBD products. I don't want to say too much about these, but they are classed as novel foods in the UK. Uh, so you mustn't make any health claims. Uh, they're basically treated like a food and they're regulated by the food um, standard agency. Uh, there are strict controls on what can and can't be on these products. Um, and um, they do slightly differ in whether they're full spectrum, broad spectrum or isolates. The only thing I'd say about these are if you're going to use CBD over the counter, that's, that's fine. Um, but you can't kind of, as the manufacturers cannot claim specific health benefits and also have to be a little bit careful because some of these products don't match what they say on the label. It's a slightly unregulated market. Um, so there's just that level of uncertainty with these, but they can be bought um, over the counter. There are some other products you might come across. Uh, on the left, I put hemp seed oils, uh, hemp seeds or hemp seed oil. These are basically like a health food. Um, so you can sprinkle those on your on your porridge in the mornings, but they've got all kinds of health benefits, uh, fatty yeah, essential oil, uh, omega three, and all kinds of things like that. But um, but they yeah they can be bought over the counter. That's hemp seed. They, I put in the middle of synthetic uh, CBD. So these are some products use these synthetic CBD. That's basically a uh, a synthetic version of CB of CBD. Uh, and that's they're, they're manufactured as pharmaceutical products and can be mixed into drinks or uh, cosmetics, those sort of things. And then you've got the CBD vape market, and that's regulated by the um, Tobacco Products Directive. Um, again, it's a little bit of an unregulated market, but they're meant to they're meant to meet MHRA requirements. These products, uh, and what they do largely is they they substitute the C, the nicotine with a, a CBD. Uh, popular of course as well but yeah that so the, look there's lots of different things out there in the marketplace but i think largely what i want to focus on today are the unlicensed cannabis based products for medical use those medical cannabis products here's a little bit of a um a summary of of what i've just gone through and i think probably we can move on from here because it gets a little bit um technical Medical cannabis, you need a prescription. Hemp CBD oils, hemp seed oil, you can buy over the counter. So why why the uh, the problems? And I think inevitably we're going to talk a bit more about this as we go through the evening. I've tried to just summarise them here. Um, so despite the law change in two thousand and eighteen, the the colleges and the the medical bodies that sort of regulate doctors have not been particularly. Um, enthusiastic about the the available data on these these products or the fact they're unlicensed so it's a little bit of a catch-22 because what they say is oh there's not enough evidence um or we don't have the data yet or the other uh, science and the, the randomized controlled trials that you'd see with um, more traditional pharmaceutical medicines but equally if that work um the, the difficulty is that if then they're not funding the trials and uh you know you're not going to get that data so that's why we need to look more widely at global data and historical data. Um, there's absolutely a lack of clinician knowledge and ignorance. Uh, there's a deep rooted stigma that exists in uh, in the medical space. I've mentioned this sort of perceived lack of ev evidence. Um, NICE, as we said, <clears throat> now NICE are the group that uh, essentially look at cost effectiveness in the NHS and, and uh, efficacy data and uh, they have only approved the three licensed medicines. Um, and then I spoke earlier about this kind of difficulty with all the different layers. These are unlicensed, these are specials medicines um, uh, that make them quite difficult to, to prescribe, especially within NHS settings. Because of those factors, the doctors take on more personal responsibility. And then there's a general kind of lack of support from colleagues. I put this point here about objections, patient knows better, because I think sometimes there is this kind of attitude amongst doctors, that uh, patients who say that something's going to help them or they want to try something, have a bit of an issue with that. And I think I certainly have come across some doctors that sort of feel like they've already made in their mind up that medical cannabis isn't going to be right for, for someone. 
Um, whereas some patients have done a lot of their own research or they, they're using cannabis already and they're finding it's very helpful. So I just think that's worth mentioning because I think we really have to work with our patients in this space. And then I've put some of the clinician's attitude and in fairness to some of my colleagues, you know, I would say I do understand where some of the reservations come from. We've all, um, most of us have looked after patients who have perhaps um, not benefited from cannabis. And we've seen some of the more detrimental side effects, particularly with high THC, um, that, that might be um, being utilized um, perhaps more in the legacies uh, space. Uh, and then a lot of this is not taught at medical schools and the endocannabinoid system, which underpins all of this. And that's the sort of physiological system that we all, that we all have. And that um, where cannabis interacts uh, with, we're, we're not taught this generally in medical schools, although uh, fortunately that is changing. And uh, I'm sure Rowan can talk a bit more about this, but the medical schools are now starting to teach teach this. Um, I put a couple of quotes here about, so I think it was 2021, um, I put a survey out to GPs and it was, it was an opinion survey on, on medical cannabis and sort of an attitude, it was an attitude survey. And we got some really interesting um, feedback and I just put a couple of the quotes in because I think they're quite interesting. They might give you kind of insight into the mindset of some, some doctors. The cannabis thing, I think it's very complex. Not that I don't think it may have some benefits. The choice of which drugs we vilify and which we prescribe, for example, SSRIs, is very arbitrary. My worry if GPs prescribe cannabis is because of cannabis position in society and the pressure that would form to prescribe it for vague indications. I think decriminalizing it is better approach than medicalizing it. Cannabis isn't pre-gabalin enough to be dealing with. If cannabis-based medicines are evaluated in secondary care, i.e. in a sort of hospital setting, and a place found for them and experience by specialists is developed and spread down to primary care with appropriate learning and experience, I would prescribe. Otherwise, as with any unlicensed drug, I don't have the knowledge or skills to prescribe it. I would need to see more evidence-based medicine studies on cannabis use in the, in the in NHS UK. Oh, sorry. And see it um, supported by NICE, the CCGs before I'd be happy to prescribe or recommend. So what they're looking for really is like a bit more robust evidence, a bit more support from, from colleagues and, and the colleges. And then I've also, um, if you look at the next slide, given some feedback that I, I got from patients. So th there we go. It's kind of uh, interesting to see how uh, the different kind of attitudes here. I feel that my GP would have me eating every antidepressant under the sun before they would consider me taking medical cannabis. Um, there we go. I'm actually not going to read through all of these, but I think what you can see there is this. <clears throat> I think what's unfortunate about this is patients are clearly going to their GPs and are kind of getting a mixed response. And I think, you know, we don't see this necessarily in other areas of medicine. Uh, so it's very much, uh, you know, luck of the draw, whether you're going to see a doctor that's understanding or a GP that wants to learn more about it or someone that's got a sort of deep uh, rooted opinion about it. Um, so yeah, I think there's a need. I mean, my my kind of interpretation of this is we just need to educate more and give doctors resources uh, that make them feel comfortable in this navigating this space. Global trends, um, hold on. So, of course, the UK is not unique, and there are about 60 countries now across the world where cannabis is, uh, uh, is legal for medical medical use. Um, it's largely GPs who are prescribing, and pharmacists also taking on quite a quite a role in this. So, so yeah, the UK sort of lags behind somewhat when it comes to access and attitudes, but we're slowly seeing some some improvements. And then, lastly, before I uh, finish off, um, just going to say a few words about the society. Um, so this was set up 2018 and uh, basically it was our mission to create a, a platform for, for doctors and prescribers and for other healthcare professionals to be able to, to learn and to uh, sort of broaden their knowledge in this, in this space. And we've now built up, we're actually just about to hit 500 mark and we've got uh, lots of um, academics and clinicians from across, across the world. And, um, and yeah, 
I mean, the, there's quite a lot on the website that's freely available to, to view if anyone's interested. And we have a uh, quite a, a good number of medical school students as well. Uh, it's free to join for medical school <clears throat> undergraduate students. And there's a little QR code there. So yeah, so that's it from me. I uh, hope that was okay. Uh, and I've, I appreciate it. I've kind of rattled through quite a few topics. Are we going to take questions at the end or are there any pressing questions at the moment? Thank you so much, Leon, for taking us through that. That was really great. Um, and there are some questions currently. So would, would Leon, would you be happy to go through a few questions now? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I mean, there's quite a lot. Uh, let's have a look. Mason, maybe um, you could read out the questions for Leon? Yeah, so right. one of the first ones I saw was, can a specialist prescribe for conditions for which they are not a specialist? Uh, no. So the um, GMC guidance states that you have to be prescribing for something within your training and your knowledge base. And they also stipulate that, um, you know, you shouldn't be prescribing for children if you're an adult. So say a neurologist, like you'd have to be a pediatric neurologist to prescribe for a child. So yeah, they, got, they are quite specific about that. And another one was some of the products being imported are stronger than skunk. What are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, that's an interesting point. It's and in fact, it's a discussion point amongst the doctor community. Um, there, we have seen quite a lot of high strength flour in the market. Um, I see it from both sides. I, I understand why there's some reservation amongst some doctors to prescribe those products. But equally, I think you also have to be considerate to those patients and people that have, have used cannabis in the past and they have some level of tolerance. And also, it, the, you know, the high THC doesn't necessarily mean it's a dangerous or more risky product. I think it, you also have to look at the terpene profiles and the amount of CBD as well. But um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting, it's an interesting one. Um, but yeah, no, I accept that. There are some quite strong products in the in the market. Of course, THC, although it has, uh, it can produce intoxicating effects. It's also very good clinically for pain and inflammation and those sort of things, sleep. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess it can really depend on what it is you're also trying to utilize it for also. So depending on yeah. the guest therapies and stuff as well, which I, I guess having a regulated market enables you to really zoom in onto the different quantities of THC and CBD to see what's yeah. most applicable to the patient. And that's also where the having those conversations with the patients about what their symptoms are and what their goals are for you to, using medical cannabis are, are really important. So yeah, really, really good question. And then another one was, are there any known benefits to cannabis and stroke recovery? Are there any trials or research on this? And they've recently seen it for MS and wondered if it would be good for stroke um, spasticity. Um, let's have a look. So I'm trying to find these, see these questions as well. It just helps me no, get This one's in the Q&A from Sonia Webb at the... Okay. Oh, the Q&A, yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. So post-stroke, yeah, there is... Um, I'm pretty confident there are some doctors prescribing for... Or post so it's that it's definitely useful for neuropathic pain post stroke um so you obviously can get nerve pain nerve damage um and yeah i mean it's obviously there's a licensed product sativex is licensed for spasticity and ms but um sativex is is basically a one-to-one -one ratio of cbd and thc so that it's not necessarily unique to sativex you'll get the same um you get those same compounds in a in a medical can in another type of medical cannabis product, um, an unlicensed medicine. So yeah, I think it's. Uh, I don't know about any trials, but if you go on PubMed and and search for it, I think you'll probably find some some work there. Thank you for that. So uh, another one is: Can you expand on why you'd rather decriminalize rather than medicalize cannabis? 
Um, well, is that my opinion on this or I don't, don't fully understand it? I think like that's there's this big debate that often gets tied into medical access and it's around decriminalizing and going for sort of adult use. Um, it's probably not, it's a, it's a big conversation piece in itself. Um, and I think there are merits to sort of, uh, to, to that conversation. Um, you know, I think like you can always look at sort of harm reduction and actually if patients, um, this doesn't apply just to cannabis, but it applies to all, all drugs and um so so yeah i mean i don't know too much about the kind of um decriminal i mean i my work really is focused on medical medical and, and prescriptions and unlicensed medicines so we'll do one more question and then i'm really sorry guys but we will have to move on over to al Kioni after this um, so I'm just going to pick one at random, but so in relation to specialist prescribing within their field, if a patient has two conditions, pain and psychiatric, would they need, need two cannabis prescribers? Um, again, that's kind of a nuanced one. Uh, the, the way around this could be that there is a requirement for an MDT. So there's a requirement for a multidisciplinary team for prescriptions so um it wouldn't be uncommon perhaps to have a psychiatrist and a pain specialist working together under an mdt um so and this is again pulls back to why i personally think gps would be really good prescribers and perfectly placed because we manage these kind of overlapping complex conditions um but yeah you may not necessarily need two prescriptions or two prescribers if there's the right skill set within a multidisciplinary team. I think just, just to add on for that briefly, what tends to happen in clinics that offer um, multiple consultants for different conditions is it's often patient led about what's the biggest uh, problem or the, yeah. the most unmet, biggest unmet clinical need for that patient. So for example, if you've got someone with uh, pain and psychiatric, psychiatric, uh, psychiatric problem, um, if the patient views the pain as being their biggest unmet clinical need, then you'd likely direct them to a pain consultant and then include a site consultant as part of your MDT for review. Thank you both for answering questions there. And then, so we're handing it over to Alcione now to take us through the T21 research. So yeah, if you are ready, Alcione. Okay, hello. Hopefully you can see the right screen and everything's good. So my name is Okiani. I've been working at Drag Science for the last three years. I'm a neuroscientist by training and I've been working on medical cannabis and doing some psychedelics work for the last three years that I've been with Drag Science. So at the moment at Drag Science, I'm managing T21, which is the UK's biggest medical cannabis study. So I'm briefly going to speak about uh, how T21 runs and uh, what it is, and then I'm going to uh, present our main findings. So T21 was launched in 2020 by Drug Science. The overall aim is doing research and furthering the scientific evidence base on medical cannabis, but at the same time, we're also enabling patient access in the UK. So as Leon said, although medical cannabis was legalized in 2018, uh, there is still very limited access through the NHS, and many patients still need to go through private healthcare uh, through the private healthcare system, which incurs high cost, um, as is the case with private healthcare. Um, so T21 allows patients to access access certain qualifying medical cannabis products at a discounted price, and at the same time we're collecting data to build up the real world evidence on the effects of cannabis-based medicinal products. We, to do this, we're collaborating with academia. So we have researchers in our team. We're also collaborating with industry and this can include clinics, uh, medical cannabis producers and dispensaries, pharmacies. And also we collaborate with clinicians and of course patients because the patient perspective is really important to us. 
So T21, as I mentioned, is the largest body of evidence uh, for the effectiveness and tolerability of medical cannabis. And we do publish our data uh, regardless of whether it's favorable or not in open access journals, because we do believe in open access for science. So the project is operating currently in the private sector, but it is our hope that as we collect and further the evidence base, this will lead to NHS funding for cannabis-based medicinal products. This is our ultimate uh, goal uh, with T21. So patients, so to join T21, patients must have a confirmed diagnosis of a condition that can be treated with medical cannabis. So this condition can include anxiety conditions um, such as generalized anxiety disorder, um, PTSD, it can include ADHD, uh, chronic pain conditions, which includes all sources of pain. So it can be from arthritic pain, fibromyalgia, but also endometriosis, uh, back and neck issues, even Crohn's disease. So there's a lot of conditions that are currently eligible for medical cannabis in the UK. And I will put the I will put the link in the chat after the, the talk so you can uh, scroll through them and see um, more information on that. So medical cannabis is not recommended yet as a first-line treatment, which means that the patients need to have tried at least two forms of other treatment, conventional medication, before they're able to be prescribed medical cannabis. And um, they need a medical summary from their GP practice. So when they registered with, with a clinic, they need to provide their uh, medical records to the cannabis clinic or pain clinic. Um, and it's important to note that all decisions regarding appropriate prescription are made by the doctor, by doctors. So T21 has no input into individual treatment. We're an observational study, so we do not in any way influence any of the medical decisions or medical care of the patient. So patients choose a clinic um, from our clinic directory, which again, I'll, I'll put the link in the in the chat afterwards and uh, make an appointment directly with the clinic. The clinic then registers the patient on sale, which is our software that we use uh, for this study. The patient then receives questionnaires every three months over email so that they can provide information on their condition and general health. And then the drug science team analyzes the data and republish papers uh, in open access journals. And again, I will link all of our papers so you can go and read if you're interested. So whatever the primary condition of patients, if patients are eligible to, to have a medical cannabis prescription, which is determined by the clinics and their prescribing doctor, then they're definitely eligible to join T21. And T21 is supported by medical cannabis uh, associations such as the such as Sanskara, MCPA, and also M. MedCan Family Foundation. So there is there are two costs to the patient. Uh, there are the clinic appointment costs, and then there is the product costs. So different clinics set their own prices for the consultation and the repeat prescriptions, and then the products are on top of those costs, and they're usually around five pounds per gram or around five pounds per ml if it's for oil. So patients who are registered on T21 do receive a, a discount in the, in the cannabis medication that they are prescribed in exchange for giving us their time and completing the, uh, the questionnaires and taking part in important research. So real, real world data is data that is derived from real world settings, which means outside of the traditional clinical trial model. This can include electronic health records, um, health insurance claims, or patient surveys. Um, and there is growing acceptance that traditional randomized control trials designs um, are not the only or even the most or even the best uh, way of determining the value of medicines. So T21 is providing this, this new approach of analyzing clinical evidence, which is through real world data. So some of the challenges of real-world data is that there is usually more missing data. 
This is because clinical trials have a more rigorous uh, approach to follow-ups and making sure that patients stay engaged with the trial. There are limits to the available data, and this can be either because some of the data is patient-reported um, or there is just gaps in the, in the records. And because of the complexity of real-world data, there is a need for AI or similar approaches to, to code and actually analyze the data. So the data is, is more complicated than it would be in a, in a clinical trial. However, there are a lot of advantages. Um, so some of these are the capacity for large samples and also the longitudinal data, which just means long-term data, basically. So with real-world data, uh, the costs are quite low. So we are able to follow up more patients for a longer period of time. Also, one of the main benefits is the range of products that are being uh, studied. So medical cannabis doesn't lend itself very well to the, to the randomized control trial model for several reasons. And one of the most important ones is that it's not a single substance. So it, it is a plant medicine and it includes, uh, it includes obviously uh, CBD, it can include THC, but it also includes other minor cannabinoids. And it also includes terpenes and flavonoids. So there's a lot of different, um, um, yeah, there's a lot of different uh, things in, in, in medical cannabis. So it, it's not it's not a single product that can be put through the randomized control trial uh, model. Um, and there's also different uh, different quantities and ratios of CBD to THC, to THC, and of course, all the rest of the terpenes and everything else. Uh, so the last main advantage of real world data is that it's actually representative of the complexity of the, of the patient group. So, I will get into this a bit later, but T21 patients have a lot of comorbidities. So that means that on top of their primary medical condition, they also have some other secondary conditions or, or issues that they're facing. And typically these patients would be excluded from participation in a clinical trial because clinical trials are looking for pure populations that are not um, more, are not complicated by, by uh, secondary conditions and multiple morbidities. So briefly, just to to mention again the the flaws and relying solely on randomized control trials. Um, first of all, some trials, some um, conditions are so rare that no pharmaceutical or government would have an incentive to fund a clinical trial uh, to find a. Uh, either a medication or a symptom relief for these conditions. So these patients would basically never be studied. But with randomized control, sorry, with uh, real world evidence, so with, with studies that follow this approach like T21, we are able to include these patients with rare diseases into our, into our sample. Um, also randomized control trials can be unnecessary when there is a treatment that uh, has been shown to have a dramatic benefit. There's also very high costs of RCTs, which usually are the restrictive factor that makes the, the studies quite, uh, the follow-up of the studies quite shorter. So most randomized controlled trials maybe uh, follow up patients for three months, maybe six months, but usually it's, it's no, no longer than that because the costs are extremely high. And then finally, RCTs um, are not too generalizable because, again, the populations that are studied are pure and they're not typical of the populations that are found in, in clinical practice. So now I'm going to briefly talk about our findings and our current T21 data. So as I mentioned, with T21, we are able to have long-term data. So at the moment, we have over 4,300 patients that have been registered and have completed their baseline assessment, so their initial evaluation. And we have almost 1,500 patients with one-year follow-up data. And then we're reaching, uh, we have over 600 patients with two-year follow-up data. 
months, that's 24 months of, of being on medical cannabis and being followed regularly. So this is a truly valuable resource that we can use for uh, to perform several analyses. And I'll present some of our findings in a second on that. So when it comes to demographic data, uh, the mean age of the patients uh, when they sign up to the project is 42 years old, but there is a, a broad range, so from 18 up to 95. Uh, about two thirds of the sample are males. And uh, as you can see from, from the graph here, the most common conditions for which patients uh, look for medical cannabis treatment are pain conditions and then psychiatric conditions. This is quite interesting because NICE recommendations, so NICE, the uh, National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, uh, so NICE recommendations um, do, do not include chronic pain as a condition for which medical cannabis uh, should be prescribed, which is very interesting and it's in, in contradiction with our findings that most patients actually are looking to access medical cannabis for chronic pain. So when it comes to patients' experiences with medical cannabis, uh, they report quite a quite a broad range of experiences when they when they join the project. So there was only eleven percent of patients that were completely cannabis naive. So that means never having tried uh, cannabis in their life before. Um, at the time of entry, there was patients who had tried medical cannabis before, but were not regularly using it in the in the present. And I wanted to report it that from, from those who reported that they did use uh, medical cannabis uh, either daily or uh, several times a day at sign up, 95% of them stated that their current use has been with the intention of treating their primary condition. So even if they had been accessing it through other sources than the, than the legal market, they were still using it to self-medicate, basically. And uh, our response rates at three months are 60%, which is quite good. This is normal for uh, observational studies. This is, um, it means that 60% of the patients who are registered at baseline remain on the project at three months. And this is normal because we, always expect uh, patients to drop off. So the most prescribed treatment is THC dominant flower at the moment. So as I mentioned before, our patients have a lot of comorbidities. So conditions that are on top of their primary condition. So we did ask patients to report what sort of other um, illnesses they suffered from. And the most common ones were depression, back and neck problems, insomnia, stress, and anxiety. So again, all of these patients are patients that would be excluded from randomized control trials um, because they have these comorbidities on top of their primary condition. And as you can see from the graph, um, most of our patients really have two or more uh, comorbidities. There's, there's only around 12% that has none. And only a quarter that has uh, one. So in T21, we ask patients to complete questionnaires that are relevant to their primary condition. So if they have chronic pain, for example, as a primary condition, we will ask them to complete a pain questionnaire. But on top of that, we also ask them to complete some questionnaires that are more, um, that let us know more about their quality of life. So we have the uh, questionnaire about mood and uh, also measures depression. We have a questionnaire about sleep, so the, the quality of sleep that patients are getting. And then we have a questionnaire in particular for, for quality of life. So this questionnaire for quality of life is called EQ5D5L. And there is normative data available for the UK household. So that means that when uh, when there was a there was a survey where a lot of people from the UK were um, asked to complete this uh, questionnaire. Which this particular question is a question from zero to hundred, with a hundred indicating the best imaginable health you can imagine. So the average of UK households was eighty five percent. However, 
on T21, the average was only 50%. So that shows that patients who are registering on T21 are facing a lot of issues and they really their, their quality of life is much worse than the average person uh, in the UK. So the low quality of life of patients, uh, together with the high number of comorbidities and the wide age range that we reported earlier, says that the myth of medical cannabis patients as young recreational users looking for a legal source of cannabis can be firmly dispelled. So we recently looked at 12 month trajectories. So we, we looked at long-term follow-up data for our patients, uh, for, for patients with either chronic pain or a psychiatric disorder. And I will present the findings on measures other than the, the disease um, questionnaire. So, so instead of presenting the pain questionnaire, for example, for chronic pain patients, I'm going to present the questionnaires that are common that we ask all of our patients to complete. And they're the quality of life, mood, and sleep questionnaires. So in this graph, you can see um, this is general health. So we are trying to assess what is the, the health of the individuals. And we ask patients to complete this questionnaire at baseline and then every three months. So you can see five different time points here from baseline up to 12 months, so one year. And you can see that Patients with chronic pain started with a lower quality of life than psychiatric patients, but both of these groups improved quite a lot by three months, and these improvements were sustained by 12 months. So that is the, the main finding. So we see that, that patients, when they access medical cannabis, their quality of life improves quite a lot, uh, significantly from baseline to three months, and then these uh, improvements are maintained. So similarly, we looked at um, quality of life. Um, so this is the, sorry, I'm, I'm gonna go back to the previous one. So this is the one that I mentioned, the, the UK household. So this is a questionnaire that's asked, it's just one question that asked from zero to 100, how are you feeling today? And we can see that uh, patients improved quite a lot uh, given that 100 is the, the best health imaginable. So, a continuation of this questionnaire, there is uh, five other questions that are asked that uh, ask the patient how are they able to go about their daily lives, if they're able to do their household activities, and questions like that, that, that measure the quality of life of the patient. So again, in this, in this questionnaire as well, higher scores uh, indicate uh, better quality of life. So again, here we can see that uh, for both chronic pain and psychiatric patients, the quality of life increases at three months, and these improvements are maintained by uh, 12 months. So the patients are feeling better at three months, and they keep feeling better until um, at 12 months. It's, it's interesting to note in this one that there's uh, significant, di significant differences in self-reported quality of life. So that means that in for chronic patients, chronic pain patients had a lower, significantly lower um, starting point, so worse quality of life than psychiatric patients. This is interesting to note. So then we looked at sleep quality. And again, this is, this is a similar graph. You can see the different time points here. However, for this questionnaire, the lower the score, it means that you have the less sleep disturbance. So you can see that patients, both psychiatric and chronic pain patients started from a similar point. So they were reporting similar disturbances in sleep. And then at three months, their sleep had significantly improved. And again, these, um, these improvements were maintained uh, by 12 months. And finally, we looked at mood and depression. So this is measured with a questionnaire that is called PHQ-9. Uh, and on this questionnaire, lower scores represent better mood. So again, you can see that psychiatric patients reported worse mood uh, than chronic pain patients. But at three months of using medical cannabis, both uh, groups of patients had improved significantly. 
and then the improvements again were maintained by 12 months so it seems like the the patients experienced the, the most improvement at three months and then it's maintained so briefly going to speak about adverse events so in patients are asked to report any side effects that they might have experienced. And these side effects are, um, are then asked to be rated as either mild, moderate, or severe. So this is the this is standard practice uh, for, for trials and, and studies. So adverse experiences were reported by 38 individuals, which represents 3% uh, of the sample, um, I think, this analysis was done a couple of months ago, so it might the percentage might be a little bit bit different now, but it's um, it's a very small percentage of patients who report any adverse events at all. And out of these uh, adverse events that were reported, the most common ones included dry mouth, feeling drowsy, and red eyes. So the majority of the mild effects were also rated as mild by the individuals who experienced them. And a lot of these side effects can be resolved by adjusting dose or adjusting the products. So as with any medication, when you first start taking it, you might uh, experience some side effects, which then dissolve over time, uh, resolve over time, sorry, uh, either by adjusting the day, the dose or changing products that you use or changing the time in the day that you're taking it or anything like that. So doctors are able to um, to work with individuals to see how they can try to resolve any any side effects. So just to just to try to to summarize what we're seeing so far in in T twenty one. So. In the UK, prescribed cannabis is accessed primarily through the private sector at the moment. Um, there's very, very few NHS prescriptions and very limited numbers of licensed medications, as Leon mentioned earlier. So we see through our T21 data, we see consistent evidence of substantial health improvements after three months of being prescribed medical cannabis. And these improvements are maintained up to a year. The rate of adverse events is very low, and most adverse events are mild. And then results from T21, together with other national and international databases, there is another uh, big uh, database in the UK uh, that is also uh, gathering data for, for medical cannabis. And there are several other databases abroad internationally, uh, especially in Canada or Australia or places where it's uh, legalized uh, either medicinally or recreationally. And all of these databases are helping to build a, a pattern of evidence. Um, so we are already seeing from this data that the, the evidence that comes in is supporting the use of CBPMs, um, cannabis-based medicinal products, to treat pain and various other psychiatric disorders. So we can see that these um, these conditions can be helped a lot by, by medical cannabis. And not only can the primary conditions improved, but the quality of life of the patients overall are also improved at the same time. So we do have further data analysis and development with T21. We're, we're doing quite a lot of things at the moment. So we one of the things we are looking at is trying to see which uh, cannabis products have the most impact on which conditions, which is a little bit difficult to do because there is a large variety of products and the, the market is not very stable at the moment. So there's always new products coming in. Um, so this is quite complicated to do, but we are aiming to do that. Um, so the most common conditions, as I mentioned, are pain and anxiety in the UK. There is evidence that uh, there are reductions in condition-specific symptoms as well as improvements in quality of life. And we also have seen uh, reductions in opioid use for chronic pain patients, which is not data I, uh, I presented here due to lack of time, but we have done a paper on this and I will link all of our papers in the, in the chat so you can have a look at that. This is, this is quite important because opioids uh, come with a lot of side effects and uh, I'm sure Rosie can, can mention a bit about that later as well. Uh, so a reduction in opioid use is definitely a favorable uh, outcome. 
So we are hoping that with this data that we have from T21, we can start looking at more refined hypotheses and start answering more complex que complex questions, such as, for example, the, um, the question I'm looking at right now, which is whether patients that have chronic pain as a primary condition, but also have depression as a comorbidity, if they experience um, more or less improvement than patients that only have chronic pain, so without the depression. So these are, are the sort of, just to give you an example of the, of the more complicated questions that we can start asking with this database um, of real world aid data that we've been building in the UK. So I will add all of these links in the chat and then thank you for listening. And these are some books that I highly recommend if you're interested. If you're interested in cannabis, you can read the cannabis book. And I highly, highly recommend Drugs Without the Hot Air, especially if you're sort of new in the in the um, drug science or, or drug policy and you want to learn more about all sorts of different drugs in the UK and their, their use, their history. Um, I definitely highly recommend this book uh, by David. So thank you very much. Sorry, no. Oh, thank you so much, Alcuni. That was really great. Um, one one question I personally had, I didn't know if you could expand on, is if this research is going to have like be able to present any clinical guidance for GPs as well. I mean, it is our hope that all of this data we're collecting will be used to influence regulations, uh, such as we, we do hope that uh, NICE uh, regulations will change. And, and this is the reason why we're gathering this, this data, um, but it's ultimately not up to us. We, we have been making the case for the importance of real world da data um, and how they should also be included together with data from clinical trials. We're not only advocating for using this sort of data, but we think that this is a, a more generalizable and more um, representative, uh, like our findings are more representative of the of the UK population and the actual patients that present in clinical care. So yeah, that is our hope. It's a very exciting for the future. Incredible. And then we have another question, if you don't mind, panelists wise, just throwing out there. Is there any research that's evidence published or ongoing data collection relating to effect of performance or impairment at work? So T21 is not measuring that, and I am not aware of, a, of any studies like that, but um, I can look that up. And if you send us an email to info at drug science, I can, um, I can see what I can find. I'm going to put our email in the chat, but I'm not aware of uh, such research at the moment. Okay, thank you, thank you. And then there are two more questions, but I might just leave those to the end time-wise so that we can still go over to Rosie. But just so everyone knows, questions will be answered, just not currently right now. But thank you for putting them in the chat. So now we're going to follow on with Rosie. So Rosie's just going to take us through her journey in terms of what it is that she's using cannabis for, how she came about using medical cannabis and what struggles, stigmas she's had around it also, and also the positives of what she's experienced with medical cannabis um, that she's experienced in her life. So yeah, take it away, Rosie. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Um, so currently I see a psychiatrist and, and prescribe medical cannabis. I use flour, by the way, which I vape. Uh, I tried oil, but sensory wise, I cannot get on with oil. Um, so I think that actually what's easiest is to talk about my diagnosis. So I have fibromyalgia and narcolepsy. Um, the fibromyalgia I developed after I was hit by a car in 2014. Um, I'm also autistic. I have ADHD, sensory processing disorder, and a few other things that, I mean, are just not as, um, I think, important to discuss right now um, or relevant. Um, so I actually found about, about medical cannabis uh, from it was on a narcolepsy forum that I'm on on Facebook. Um, I, after I was hit by a car in 2014, I was struggling immensely with pain. None of the pain medications they were giving me through the kind of tablets, pharmaceuticals were working. Um, my pain levels, if my pain was, wasn't was under control, that impacted my tiredness, which means my narcolepsy was worse. Um, and yeah, I so I had a human child, I say, in 2019, early 2019. Um, 
and yeah just to be honest needed to function needed to be able to you know be able to be a parent and everything so I looked into the start of my medical cannabis journey I have used cannabis before then um before pregnancy um I didn't use anything in pregnancy even like the sound of people drinking or eating was annoying let alone anything else um so yeah I what was I saying I've got myself confused now where I was um that's ADHD for you uh so yeah my start of the journey so I basically found about T21 um at the time project 2021 was what they were called um and basically just delved into it to be honest delved into speaking to people from drug science um having my questions answered eventually went under a clinic I started initially under pain um I found that any of the flowers as I said I did try oils they do work well I just sensory wise couldn't couldn't cope with um oils um anything I was really prescribed was managing my pain very well I then so at the time when I was started on T21, I was diagnosed with almost every single mental health condition under the sun. Um, I am correctly now diagnosed with being neurodivergent. So, uh, yeah, basically when I started T21, I was on a lot of painkillers. Um, not even tramadol works for me. I was the only one that did work was naproxen, which was absolutely destroying my stomach. I do have stomach issues now. I've also had to have my gallbladder out, which I do wonder the links between a lot of the medications I was put under. But that's another story for another day. Um, and yeah, I was on quite a lot of serious mental health medication. And I'm not talking antidepressants. I'm talking about they put me on antipsychotics as mood stabilizers because of my incorrect diagnosis at the time. Um, I'm going to try and summarize my journey on T21 um, and really focus on the things of why I'm here today to talk is because I think it's really important to share the information. There is a lot of stigma. I live in Brighton and Hove. So cannabis use is not it's not questioned, it's not frowned upon, but for the kind of wider circle in the UK and around the world, I think it's really important how amazing and empowering and to be honest, life-changing it has been for me. I am now on, I take no pain medication at all. Um, on my kind of hormonal period cycles, I may take paracetamol or ibuprofen. Apart from that, I never need anything, anything prescribed for my pain. I'm also now on no, absolutely no mental health medication as well. Um, and that's kind of what really brings me to doing discussions like this is because I feel like living proof of what I thought about cannabis. I do understand a lot of the science behind it. I, I'm fascinated by it all and I really take a look at I guess a learning attitude towards it um but yeah for me it has given me stability also having a human child if anyone knows anything about the kind of social uh, services systems in this country if they found out I was using cannabis and I was not on t21 and I wasn't legally backed I know I know exactly kind of the route um I don't need to go into it anymore but I know exactly the route that would um essentially essentially I would come under um, for not using what I know works um, it, as I said I'm prescribed it for ADHD and my fibromyalgia but interestingly they also so I have narcolepsy which is a neurological sleep condition they when I had my last overnight sleep study and daytime study they actually asked me to bring in my medical cannabis because their research for narcoleptics and essentially any kind of chronic fatigue they 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 have an understanding of what they think, but actually trying to get people into sleep studies on the NHS who are legally prescribed cannabis is essentially it's a lot rarer. Um, and it confirms all their findings. Like, so I'm prescribed one thing for daytime use, which um, is a sativa. So it makes me energetic. It helps me focus. Um, it, yeah, I'm now held down the a job for over a year, which is the longest amount of time that I have been working. Um, which again is amazing, quite mind blowing for me. Um, and yeah, as I said, the neurologists, although they, you know, they're NHS neurologists, they actually, you know, found it very interesting that the cannabis did exactly for my brain during the day what they thought it would. And then at night, reducing my night terrors, nightmares, sleep paralysis, and things from a narcolepsy point of view. Um, so it, as I said, it's, although I'm prescribed it for certain things, actually the amount of, I am one person, I'm one body, and it's made a massive difference to me kind of overall. Um, 
Macy, carry on asking me another question before I ramble on. Stop it. Honestly, Rosie, that was incredible. You've kind of all the questions I was going to ask, I would think of one and then you'd answer it straight away. So it's really, really great to hear your experience. And it sounds like you've had really positive communications with prescribers as well. Is that the general, like before, had you ever like mentioned to um, like your GP, whatever about medical cannabis? Was there any like take backs from them or have they always been quite receptive and open to it? My GPs in Brighton have always been very supportive. However, the psychiatry teams here in the city, basically, um, I've gone through quite a lot myself, um, even to the point I lost my mum shortly after my daughter was born, and they would not give me any therapeutic support if I was using medical cannabis and things like that. So I'm being rejected. Sorry, that's my dog, one of my dogs behind me waking up. Oh, she's got mad sleep now. Um, yeah, basically reject, uh, rejected me from services, giving me support based on the on the grounds I was using cannabis. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is it's mind blowing that mm-hmm. I can have doors shut on me when I'm asking for help when just on that grounds, because it, it's, you know, it's a very outdated view um, that cannabis kind of destroys mental ill health and things like that. And that's, as I said, kind of what I said before is why I'm here today, because I honestly believe without medical cannabis and without the stability and the legal backing, um, I don't think that I would be mental health drug free or painkiller free. Um, And for me, those things, as I said, I'm on the least amount of medication. I'm 35 now. I'm on the least amount of medication since being on medical cannabis than I have been since my early 20s. Um, And it's, yeah, as I said, I don't get any side effects. Um, I don't actually use CBD. Um, as I said, this is something that very much you work with your your prescriber and your clinician about. Um, and yeah, as I said, I mean, what more proof is there than the fact that I'm on on very little, very low low doses. So I do still take ADHD meds, but that's more from my narcolepsy point of view to keep give me stability. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm on a lot lower doses of, of, of everything essentially, and a lot of medications stopped. And as I said, the fact that I'm not on any mental health medication anymore, and that's one of the biggest taboos and stigmas is, well, it will make your mental, it will cause your mental health and all this. And it's like, well, no, actually, if you want to look at my historic files, you know, the proof is there like I'm I'm being prescribed this medicinally and it's doing exactly what I have always thought and known it would do and actually given me the ability to come off uh, yeah as I said a lot of really serious mental health medication that was the side effects of those um, was insane and if you if someone met me before being prescribed medical cannabis I was a lot bigger I didn't I if I'm being totally honest I didn't really value myself my body um, and yeah I was a, a a lot bigger, my BMI and everything. Whereas now I I really work on myself. It gives me a lot of enthusiasm. It gives me a well-controlled appetite. I cycle. I mean, there's not much I don't do. Um, and yeah, as I said, my big thanks is to T21 and drug science and, and kind of a lot of the people that are fighting this in this country um, and all over the world to get cannabis. I'm not going to say for the first time, uh, you know understood as a medicine it's re-understanding it and basically trying to dismiss politics and in the involvement of politicians within something that is essentially medicine or or should be as I said decriminalized or or legalized yeah well it's really beautiful to hear you've been able to have that reflection on your own journey to see where you started and when you are where you are now but not even just in terms of the amount of medications you're prescribing, but generally like how you're feeling yourself and having more of that time to have that, that self, that self love, even in that expression to do have more things in your life. And it's, it's a shame that the um, psychiatry team weren't able to be receptive to your cannabis use and the, also the use that you were having um, with and being able to give you the support of those issues at the time. So I, I it, that's a really difficult one, especially when it's it's quite well understood that you utilizing medical cannabis is, is u- usually a really great tool to to access the 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 other tools that you can get through therapy and different types of psychological tools as well. So thank you so much for sharing on that. And Alcuni, your hand is raised. Would you like to say something? 
Yeah, I just I just wanted to mention on that that uh, Rosie, thank you for for showing as well the importance of of quality of life because a lot of studies just focus very specifically on like reduction in specific symptoms and they don't look overall at the at the patient's patient's experience. Obviously, it's really important to have reduction in in pain, and but this is something that opiates can do at the same time while. At, uh, massively uh, impacting the quality of life. While medical cannabis seem to not have the same effect, if anything, it seems to improve other co aspects of quality of life. So that's 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 really important. And thank you for demonstrating that that point with your with your own experience. Thank you, Rosie. Yeah. And um, Rosie, I was just wanting to ask, like, so what is your like current dosage for cannabis? So you said uh, is it sativa during the day and then indica strain at night how a uh, hybrid is... in the evening um, the... yeah i'm i'm quite um sensitive to any form of medication to be honest um and i found on on pure like more dominant indicas um the appetite where my narcolepsy meds run off in the evening my appetite essentially if i use my indica in the evening would just it would make me want to eat everything in sight um which is why as i said it's it's you know case by case basis um but also it does allow me to eat in the evening because a lot of my medication I take during the day suppresses an app and my appetite and and as I said it's been a bit of a learning journey um and one of the things I wanted to mention I've so I've I, I vape outside um and again I've tried a lot of different vapes and it's it's really about what works for you um but on the days that I've gone oh it's too cold especially when it's been snowing here I'm like oh, okay I'll be fine I'll sleep okay I don't need to I don't need to medicate and it's like I barely sleep that night I wake up anywhere between every 20 minutes uh, sometimes every hour um, so again for me it's like no go outside and vape because you know if you don't you're not going to probably you know get any good sleep which I'd, I mean I don't know about anyone else but if I don't sleep well at night I'm not not a very uh, bearable person the next day to be around put it that way no I fully relate to that sleep is very important to just general day needing to function and seeing as you've got your human child as well now sleep is definitely an important part of your lifestyle for sure um so yeah thank you so much so much for sharing your input on on your ex just sharing your experiences i can see in the um chat section i don't know if you've seen but a lot of people seem to have related to a lot of things that you've said which is just i think that's one of the beautiful things about how how important the patient perspective is is the connections that you build with people it's such a it's such a massive community within people accessing medical cannabis and because of the stigma, often it can feel quite isolating. You can feel quite alone in it. But I guess having events like this where we're able to have those rational conversations and be able to be open with one another about each other's experience, it really builds the, that community to show that this is what what a lot of us are advocating and work towards is really strong and really powerful. And a lot of what you said has definitely touched a lot of people. It's, it's yeah, some very, very powerful conversations this evening. So thank you to... Rosie and all speakers and everyone that was able to tune in this evening. It's yeah, a really positive community to be part of. So thank you all. And then I see we've still got two questions in the Q&A. So would it be possible for us with are all panelists happy to go through these two questions? Yeah, okay. So the first one that we have currently got is, while I understand your point regarding the complexes complexity of this marvelous plant i'm wondering if a patient specific combination of the plants gene slash benefits can be tailored to every individual like is currently being done with immunotherapy cancer and hrt treatments do you see more specific studies being done on matching cannabis benefits to a person's endocannabinoid system the system within all of us that's been that is there for a reason Oh, Rowan, go ahead. I think uh, it's okay to briefly cover that. We actually got asked a very, very similar question at the last drug science event here in Birmingham. Um, and uh, the panel gave a very, a very good answer saying, whilst it is possible to map someone's what we'd call endocannabinoid tone, so the amount of uh, endocannabinoids that they're producing within their body, the clinical benefit of doing that is a little bit debatable, um, which, we, which we'd see in many medications as well. And sometimes actually the, the, the trial and error element of it can actually be quite beneficial. 
um, of allowing people to explore what works well for them at different times. I think this question actually leads on to the role of terpenes and minor cannabinoids within cannabis as well. I don't know if um, Leon or Al Coloni would like to, to address terpenes and minor cannabinoids briefly, because I'm not sure that's something we've really covered this evening. Okay, Annie, do you want to... I was just going to mention that I did briefly mention that in my presentation, uh, there is uh, obviously over um, 150 or so minor cannabinoids that are present in the in the cannabis plant. So, yeah, well, there are some companies that are doing uh, genetic analysis and are claiming to be able to match this. Um, this is probably of yeah low low uh, value clinically, and it's. I don't think the technology is there yet and there the products are changing so so fast and we don't even have enough information on all of the products so at the moment i don't think it's a requirement for example to have the the terpene profile uh of the of the medications i think leon maybe that is something that you might know best but um it is it is something that might happen in the next decade or so but it's not um very likely to to happen very soon Feel free to add something if you want, Leon. Sorry. Um, no, no, I think you've covered that pretty well. The um, obviously, you know, this differs as a plant-based medicine. So, is my sound all right on your? Very echoey. Am I? Okay, never mind. Um, yeah. So the 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 other thing to, is to say is that because these are plants that are grown in soil, you know, like batches can change as well so you know they're not as specific as a single compound like a like uh, aspirin or an antibiotic that you might be prescribed by your doctor so um there is that kind of uh difficulty sometimes in controlling batches so sometimes patients who have been on the same product for for months or years maybe have to change to a slightly different strain or you know things things differ across batches um so, so that's one point to make with a plant-based medicine. And then, yeah, as Alki only said, the, you know, there's all these other compounds that are in the plant, like terpenes and minor cannabinoids, flavonoids. And I'm sure in time we'll kind of know a lot more about them. And I think where the interesting research, um, it, it, I think the interesting research is, is already happening and it's looking at different combinations of cannabinoids. And this is where sort of AI and algorithms can be really helpful because we know that already that um, certain combinations of cannabinoids can have profound effects on things like cancer lines and you know in mouse model and animal models and things like that. So so um, so yeah, there's some really interesting research going on about combinations of cannabinoids as well. And then I think yeah, of course, like there will be hopefully in time. Um, looking at biomarkers and genetics of individuals and then tailoring treatments to those um, genetic profiles. But we're definitely some way off that at the moment. Yeah, well, thank you for both your input. Well, all three of your inputs, guys. It is it is quite an exciting field, the field of genetics at the moment. But like you say, we have got quite a way to go, especially if we're kind of only just establishing a place for cannabis in our society to then establish a place of doing genetic screening to, to, to be able to link people to the right type of medication for cannabis. So yeah, we have quite a way to go within that area, but yeah, thank you all for the insights there. So the last question I can see on here is from Hannah, which says, we know there's a clear link to cannabis over overuse and mental health. I'm assuming if these products were to be prescribed for psychological symptoms, the prescriber would need to know to know the patient's condition isn't a side effect of cannabis use. How have you monitored this and how will this be monitored slash addressed? Um, so I think just from a from a clinical point of view, the, the link between uh, cannabis and mental health is particularly with cannabis and psychosis or cannabis induced psychosis. Um, I'm sure someone will correct me. I'm not entirely convinced there's any, any link between any other mental health conditions and, and cannabis use. Um, there's quite a large study being done in London at the moment, led by Marta De Forti, um, called Cannabis and Me, looking at the role of cannabis and cannabis-induced psychosis. So clinically, if you come to a medical cannabis clinic, 
And one of the things that you're always asked about is either if you as an individual or a first degree relative has a history of psychosis, because this predisposes you to this cannabis induced psychosis. Um, so commissions are, are careful about this to make sure that cannabis can potentially um, have negative health impacts. So clinicians are responsible for making sure that you're not at risk of developing these. Um, however, I'm sure the other panelists will correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but I don't believe there's any association between cannabis and any other mental health condition. There has been reports uh, of of other uh, either in, in t uh, increased anxiety or, or things like that. However, this is not something that we have seen in T21. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the rate of side effects is very small, and uh, they're usually more. Uh, the most common ones are dry eyes and uh, sore mouth. Uh, but um, first of all, I would like to say that because the 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 way the the question is posed. Um, Cannabis is already being prescribed for psychological symptoms. So I just wanted to make that sure that was that was part of my presentation. Um, our, our, our research was done on, on patients that had uh, um, psychiatric disorders as a, as a primary uh, disorder. Um, and so T21 does not take um, account for that. As I mentioned, it's a, it's a observational study, not a clinical trial. So we do not have specific inclusion and exclusion criteria. So the only inclusion criteria is that the patient needs to be eligible for medical cannabis. And this eligibility is um, defined by the prescribing clinician. So I will pass on to you, Leon, uh, as a prescribing um, prescriber, if you can answer on if you need to to make sure that, um, uh, yeah. I, I'm actually not a prescriber currently uh, as a GP, but I work with a lot of prescribers, of course. I'm just kind of rereading the question. I think it's what it's asking is um, how can we make sure if someone's kind of coming to medical cannabis, but there's cannabis overuse uh, problems. So how do we know the condition that that's not a side effect of cannabis use? How would, how would you monitor it? I think like it's very case specific and the psychiatrists that will be working at T21 or in the private clinics will obviously have to do a full comprehensive history. And if they do feel there's problematic cannabis use, that patient may not end up with a prescription. They may end up saying to them, best thing you could do for now is to kind of slowly wean off your cannabis use. I mean, it's just hard to comment on individual cases, but yeah, of course, like there are some circumstances where um, that patient might perhaps not be benefiting from it or they're on the wrong type of, of cannabis. So maybe it needs to be titrated off and then slowly in reintroduced. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's Yeah, an it's... Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to mention that um, we did have a look at the, the patients that were already um, taking cannabis uh, when they started the study. Over 95% of them were taking it for um, medicinal reasons, so to treat one or so of their symptoms or conditions. So again, it's like patients might already be using it to help them with their symptoms. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it's very case specific. It's, a, it's very nuanced. Uh, I think there's a the kind of divide, which I think you've talked talked touched on really well, Alki, only between uh, medical use and cannabis abuse being very different different things. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the patients I know we see in, in T21 and in, in, in clinics are, are prescribed medical cannabis and use it very responsibly and very well. Um, but that is very, very different to someone who's got a history of cannabis abuse, um, either using very high THC uh, cannabis and very large amounts of cannabis. So I've, I've seen there's been a, a Zool's put a question in the chat about associated anxiety and depression with cannabis. And I think Alki only talked about the side effect profiles within, a, um, within the study of what T21 has found. Um, that's not necessarily applicable to people that are abusing cannabis um, who may experience a higher incidence of these side effects and symptoms. Yeah, it's that's a really interesting point because I guess the with medical cannabis in general, it gives people the opportunity to access support to avoid that 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 excessive use in general. So I I, I understand why maybe someone that's maybe using it um, recreationally rather than from a medical perspective, there is a higher incidence of people having those more adverse effects that we're not able to keep track of just due to the fact that we can't 
research it in a way that we can in a clinical setting or from an observational setting of 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 it being clinical so it's yeah it's it's really hard to find to find whether those whether whether medical cannabis can actually has those more adverse effects but like Alki only said from the research that's been going on with t21 those adverse effects of more rebound psychological um issues hasn't hasn't been identified whereas um which can really point to the fact that with gps guidance and support to patients it can really change how we how we how patients can experience adverse effects from a recreational perspective instead so yeah thank you for the question definitely very probing and rosie you go ahead going to tackle two of the questions that I saw about um, anxiety, depression, and also the the recreational drug use and um, um, poor mental health. Um, because I think there are two points that one, if you are using cannabis that you haven't either got a prescription for or grown yourself, you actually have no idea what you're getting um, on the illicit market, the illegal market. You know, people can tell you that it's this, but you actually you don't know. Therefore, the impact psychologically, physically, mentally, you just you don't know how it's going to impact you because you essentially a person wouldn't know what they're getting. Um, as I said, it's different whether you're getting your prescription or also, as I said, I know that people do grow it themselves. Um, and the other point I was just going to um, think about um, the poor mental health um, people being de described um recre recreational drug use is obviously a slightly different topic to medical cannabis which is what we're obviously speaking about here tonight um but um yeah i i certainly have never had any of my clinicians whether nhs or otherwise especially i talk about it very openly with all my nhs doctors now and i've never had any one of them whether they're psychiatry neurology pain management anything um or my neurodivergent kind of diagnosis so obviously that's neurodevelopmental team have ever spoken about um, cannabis use linking into poor mental health at all. Um, obviously that's just, I'm one person, um, but I was just said, yeah, just wanted to kind of share that, yeah, no one has ever said or kind of raised that as a flag at all, much the opposite actually. Um, and that's mostly by NHS doctors because, I, because I'm quite an advocate personally for what I believe in and the research that's there. Um, yeah, as I said, in the link to mental health, much the opposite reaction. Yeah, thank you, Rosie, for sharing that for sure. Um, and I don't. Okay, I think that's the last of the questions that we had left in the Q and A. Unless anyone has any more questions that they want to put in quickly at all. Okay, I don't think there's any more questions. So just thank you everyone who came to watch this evening. It's been great to have you all here. And again, thank you so much to the speakers for putting in the time and effort to also be here tonight, share your stories, share your research, share your passion. It's yeah, it's been a great place to, to all come together and do that. So I'm really, really grateful for it. Um, thank you, Maisie, for hosting as well and, and Rowan for organizing this. Thank you very much. It's okay. It's been an absolute pleasure, guys, genuinely. So I hope you all have a great evening. Um, and let's go medical cannabis. <laughs> <laughs>